Uh, a couple of announcements before we start tonight's featured speaker. Prisoners of War from World War II will speak at Clark on December 7th. The anniversary of Pearl Harbor from 6.30 to 9 p.m. in Atwood Hall. The program is free and open to the public and is being sponsored by the XPOW Speakers Bureau as part of Lois Brin's co-paced course, Human Conceptions of Death. For more information, call 793-7681. Uh, there will also be a general meeting for all speakers forum members this Thursday, November 16th at 7.30 in the Dana Pit. Tonight, the Speakers Forum of Clark University presents Holocaust survivor Mr. Mark Berkowitz. Mr. Berkowitz was forced to serve as Joseph Mengele's errand boy while a prisoner at the concentration camp at Auschwitz. Arriving at Auschwitz from Czechoslovakia in March of 1944 with their mother, the 12-year-old Berkowitz and his twin sister were singled out for repeated torture and medical experimentation at the hands of Joseph Mengele, the Nazi's infamous angel of death. Fascinated by Berkowitz's refusal to hate his tormentors, Mengele himself tattooed the boy's prisoner number on Berkowitz's arm and made him his personal assistant and messenger. Mengele made numerous attempts to break Berkowitz's spirit, including sending the boy on an errand run to the crematorium to watch his mother march to her death. Berkowitz, now 57 and a retired New York furniture salesman, claims he does not wish revenge on Mengele or the Nazis. He believes instead that Mengele was simply a person who was taught how to hate and who could be redeemed if he were to follow Berkowitz's example of courage and forgiveness. One thing that Mr. Berkowitz presented to me before when I was speaking to him, this New York Mirror newspaper article dated Friday, March 12, 1961, shows Mr. Berkowitz at the movie Mein Kampf and in the movie seeing himself presented on the screen, which is an unbelievable sight. On behalf of the Clark Speakers Forum, please give a warm welcome to Mr. Mark Berkowitz. First, let me say thank you to all of you for being here this evening and all the people that made it possible for me to be here, not to lecture you, nor to teach you. There are better things in life one can learn than to learn what it is to spend even a moment in Auschwitz. There are beautiful things in this world that we can all learn and appreciate, but what I am here for is to share with you our humanity, because after all, Auschwitz is humanity. What was destroyed in Auschwitz is part of you, part of our family. How important a part? That's individual. To me, when I think of the children, I think the most important part of my life was destroyed right there. And so I say thank you and God bless you and I love you for having me here. I don't want to correct anything the young man said here before. Forgiving is very easy. But for someone to forgive oneself, I believe is almost impossible. And I wouldn't want to have been nor would I want to be in Dr. Joseph Mengele's shoes. I don't resent anything about him except the name Joseph. That I would love to have the right to take away from him. I would like that name not to be Joseph, whatever else, but not Joseph. It doesn't belong to him at all. It's ironic that Joseph should be at the ramp 
at the arrival of Auschwitz. But nevertheless, we have to realize that uh, Dr. Joseph Mengele was not at, alone there. Neither was he the sole builder of Auschwitz. <coughs> Neither were the German people the sole builders of Auschwitz. We still have people in this world today who are ready to build or rebuild or reopen Auschwitz. And I want to share a moment with you so that I should not fail to tell you this. For me, tonight is an exceptionally difficult night because I'm still excited about what's happening in Germany. I never accepted a divided Germany. No way can a human being under any circumstance, divide the people. I could never be divided from my people, so who am I to ever demand that of another person? I arrived in Auschwitz, a good Jewish child. I was liberated, a good Jewish child. A child with love for God, love for humanity, respect for my elders, concern, if I could, for people having less than I have, and it doesn't have to be in material things, it could be in a question of faith. My whole life I've been sharing one thing that I have an abundance of, and that is faith and love and devotion. But I'm neither a fool to believe that we're absent of this world still plenty of hate, plenty of people ready to incarcerate Mark Berkowitz, not because I'm saying something bad, but because I'm saying something too nice to sometime even to be understood. I had newspaper people who don't believe what I say, and I don't blame them, but it's true. I don't have to say it if it's not true. And one of the things that I want to share with you, and you'll notice that I'm not in order, because life for me has never been in order. Um, if ever I do anything with my life in regard to literary work or a TV made, uh, movie made for TV or anything, the first credit I give for my life is to God. And I want to share this with you because Finally, even German scholars and historians are agreeing that Mark Berkowitz is not telling a lie. I want you to know that our armies, including our great Russian army, and I want to say great Russian army, or Russian allied army, as the British had allied armies, as the Americans had allied armies, and our young men who gave with their last measure of devotion Nothing to be taken away from them. But if not for the miracle of God, I am in doubt if the victory would have been as quick or at all. I saw the miracle of God. From 1941 till 1943, I wandered through the Flatlands, by the Dniester, by the Dnieper, by every river that comes from major rivers. I walked through the hillside, and I want to tell you something. Nobody saw the way I saw with my own eyes the great panzers being stopped by hurricanes, by weather that even the German hierarchy in the military were convinced that they had studied that weather for 50 some odd years. They were convinced that they had every dress necessary for every weather. <coughs> you want to know the truth? They did not have the proper equipment, nor the proper dress. But it seems that we can so easily minimize when we see that terrible defeat in Stalingrad when we see that they were not stopped by bullets. What stopped the great Von Polis's army? The great Von Polis, can you tell me? 
they froze to death at the point where they had received already from Germany not only winter clothes, but mink coats and Persian lamb coats. And at that point, they robbed the Russians of their winter clothing already. And I saw the good, heavy, you know, what you would say, the animal skin inside and the, 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 the hard skin outside, I saw it. The gun wouldn't fire, the finger froze. Are you gonna tell me that finally when Zhukov came with his Siberian army, and of course he was there to clean up one Polis's army, but what was left of it? And yet few survivors are willing to admit that if not for Hashem, if not for our Heavenly Father, whether you're a Christian or a Jew, a Muslim or a Buddhist, or, 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 a, um, or um, as Oppenheimer quoted from, uh, from the Hindu scripture, a Hindu, I don't care what human being you are, you had to be there when I stood there as a little Jewish boy and watched this general take horses and mules and, and bulls and cows and whatever animal, even dogs, even ducks, even geese to pull that diesel tractor, that diesel machine out of the mud, and they couldn't move. I gave an interview to the German people, and of course I told them, you know better than I do. But one thing I want to tell you, the proudest moment I had going through Germany after liberation was not to see the German people suffer. No, I suffered. I don't want to see anybody suffer. I know what it is to suffer. No human being deserves to suffer because there is good in all of us. Unfortunately, it's so easy sometimes to indoctrinate a human being into hate. Why? I don't know. It's so easy to cut our lives away from real life as I was taught when I went to Hader, how to share how to care, that loving God, and I'm not talking because you notice I don't have a yarmulke, and I'm not saying that I'm being fair in that. I'm not being fair, I'm willing to admit that. But to me, God and religion is, is a little bit separated. I can have great love for God and I may not be a religious person. That doesn't mean that because of my love for God that I would resent or deny someone their religious faith. Not at all. We all, we could all walk together. So when I look at Dr. Joseph Mengele, of course I see a brilliant man who destroyed his life for what? Don't you think that I saw Mengele when his face was swollen from tears, when his eyes were bloodshot and he came to say adieu to me Christmas Eve while we were singing a Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht, and there were other Christians there and I was watching while some of their smoke and the pukes were still coming out, the last bread out of the crematoriums, or the dead bodies scattered all over. What has that got to do with faith? Should I not sing Silent Night with them? I think it's beautiful, it still touches me. Or should I not say Kol Nidre? Or should a Christian not appreciate my Kol Nidre as I would appreciate his Silent Night? Is it only from a religious point of view? It so happens to be Silent Night was not created for a Christmas holiday, it was created for an Onik Shabbat. That's the truth, by a Mr. Gruber but somebody liked it and thought it was sentimental enough and made it into a Christmas type of theme. Uh, do I disagree with that? I think Kol Nidre is to me one of the most beautiful chants in the world. I think Ave Maria is a beautiful chant. If we could only feel what we say when, what we say, when we say it, if we could only feel the music and the sentiment. So what am I trying to tell you? As a survivor, I owe it to first acknowledge that without 
God, I wouldn't be here today. Without God, there would have been no survivor whatsoever because the few and the very few that survived, and some people claim that it possibly is true because they claim the more faith a person has. Now you have to realize education and faith is not the same. Being a wise person, I met so many wise people, leaders of countries, leaders of parties, and they said to me, they're Puperl, they're Kleiner, they're David, David, David Leiden. That little boy, that, you know, the Austrians say Puppel, the Knabe, the Bursch, that would labor. Why? Because the way not to be a victim is to look at the other person as the victim. Can everyone do it? I cannot answer that. But when I saw what these human beasts were able to do, how they were destroying their lives, their families' lives, and now comes the biggest tragedy of it all. The future lives of German youth, when they have to mingle on this planet Earth with other human beings of other faith, of other cultures, and they have to admit that their fathers and grandfathers are murderers, that I cannot help them. See, that's where forgiveness wouldn't even, would not even answer. Because once you're a murderer, you're a murderer. There's nothing on earth I can do to absolve him of that. And can he do it? I'm very doubtful. Because I know that when I do something terribly wrong to someone, I know how much it hurts me and how long it takes me to be able to rationalize it so that I could deal with it and live with it. As human beings, we have an obligation to ourselves to understand life and the span of life. If we could only understand how short life is, we would neither have time for hate nor time to divide. What a blessing from God that we don't know when that clock stops. We take it for granted that it's going to go on forever. Unfortunately, and it's unfortunate, it sometimes stops <coughs> at a time when you least expect it and then you say to yourself, why didn't I start to live yet? And if you live with hate, it is almost impossible to realize what life is all about. So I really feel terrible for some innocent German children who will have to live with this blemish. And there's nothing on earth I can do. I wish I could. There's nothing on earth I can do. Uh, I want to tell you this because somebody thanked me about two years ago. Somebody I met in New York City on Madison Avenue and 53rd Street on the corner. And he said to me, I heard that some people were out to get Ralph Mengele, Joseph Mengele's only, supposedly only, legal son. And I heard that you intervened. And you said, please, if you hurt him, you would be hurting me. I don't know what his sympathies are to his father. I don't know whether he feels that what his father did was right or wrong, but let us not become killers. Let us not be judge and jury. We saw when they tried to be judge and jury, we saw what they accomplished and what they have to live with. So I think this gives you more or less a picture of what I am and what I would like to be until my time comes to meet my maker. Whether or not one meets his maker or not, I cannot tell you. But if I do meet my maker, I know he's going to say one thing to me. Competition I don't need, if you know what that means. <laughs> and I'm not going to be his competition. I was born in Czechoslovakia 
in a hamlet called Salatvina, Salatvina. The Russians today, and that's part of the area that's being debated today where it belongs. In fact, it's still called Salatvina. It's near the Tisa River, it's near Maramora Siget, near Siget. I'm right across the Tisa, on my side is Salatvan and the other side is Siget. We were seven children, mother and father of course, and grandparents. And in our home we only learned one thing from our parents. How to be good human beings. It seems that that was all they were interested in, not to be great scholars or great or great uh, providers or great uh, successful people, but how to be first. Get the kinder, get the mention. Get the kinder, get the mention. Good children, kind. Kindness was such an important thing to appreciate music, all kinds of music, to appreciate people, all kinds of people. There was no such thing as someone inferior. <laughs> that would have been a crime. A man who had a hunchback had to be treated equally to the most handsomest guy who might have looked like Clark Gable. And a person who was poor of very meek means had to be treated equally to a prince that came into the house. I'm grateful to my parents for giving me that riches because no one can take that away from me. I took that with me to Auschwitz throughout my life. And of course, like everything else, comes to an end, that came to an end. 1941, right before Pesach, we saw the, the clouds, the storm gathering. And the truth of the matter is, because I'm talking to you people and you saw in the last few weeks, the evil empire suddenly turned a cheek that we, our president is in shock. He doesn't know how to interpret it. He doesn't know whether it's venom or whether it's uh, honey. He doesn't know whether it's good or whether it's bad. He doesn't know what to say. And it's really difficult. And this is unfortunately the way evil things happen too. Suddenly, out of the Cleveland sky, one morning, a knock on the door. That's all. A knock on the door. And what you thought was a civilized world comes to an end, except what you taught within your own family. My father served in the First World War, so he wasn't exactly a person that didn't know what war was all about. He was wounded in his wrist and in his leg, and those days they didn't have the medical means to heal so he had an infection, and in essence, he left a hole that he could take a Q-tip and literally go from one side to the other. But he was a grateful person. He survived, and he felt proud that he served his country. He was a good soldier, and there's nothing wrong with being a soldier. In defending your country, there's nothing wrong. In defending justice, there's nothing wrong. But evidently, he was a Jew. And the fact that he served the Kaiser in the First World War had no meaning, and he was only a Jew. And so these two men came in with their guns drawn, and they said, you have, they didn't say, have Berkowitz, they didn't say, Mr. they said, you have five minutes to pack. Since we were preparing for Passover, and everything was already Passover, you know, dishes and tablecloth and all that, my mother, took a few little items and he said, you don't need much because where you're going, you're not going to need anything. Just five kilos. So she took some vegetables, some fruit, some cookies, some whatever, and she put it into the tablecloth and she made a bundle out of it. And I was a little boy and I was almost ashamed to have my father put it on his back. See, like this speckle of fleckle, you know? So I put it on my back, and when we walked outside, and it's still there, everything is still there, a wagon with hay was waiting for us. And so like, uh, like a caravan, we were taken away, and uh, before you could realize, we were on a main railroad station, 
and from there we were boarding a train that wasn't fit for cattle because when I went on the train and I put my foot down, it went right through the rotten board. So I said to my mother and to the other people, be careful because you could hurt yourself here. And so we tried to pick out the, the strongest part of, of the floor. And uh, then the kettle cars closed. And before you know, we arrived. When I say before you know, we arrived in a place called Yasin. It's still there. Every place that I mentioned is still there. Yasin is still called Yasin. In fact, recently they were talking about Yasin. And we arrived in Yasin and we were put into what they call a lumber camp because Yasin is a big lumber yard because the river is there and the, much of the wood was always sent down with the river. And when we arrived in the camp, of course, we went through the gate and one thing though that we, I always heard my mother say is as long as we're together, as long as we're together. And so rumors went around because I want you to know that the truth of the matter, there was no genius. They had such schemes. I think the biggest moron turned out to be a genius. They were able to scheme in such ways that really the truth is nobody could ever find out the truth. But rumors got around and I used to go to the gate where they were standing there and uh, they were kicking a ball, so I would kick a ball and I would hear them say some, you know, dirty Jew and what's going to happen if they only knew what's going to happen to them and if they only know how short, how short a time they have on this, uh, on this uh, earth, on this, you know. And then rumors went around that if a truck comes with a beige canvas, it means you go to work. If it comes with a black canvas, it means that uh, it's the end. And so my father heard the rumors and he came to us, to the family, and he said, look, we're all together. Should we go first or should we wait till the last ones? And I don't know why my father came to me and said to me, what do you think we should do? And I said, father, we're in dirt, but not dirt, mud, knee-high, but we're together, and we're getting used to this mud. Let's stay. But ultimately, we had to leave too. And so a truck came, and it was a black canvas. But we were loaded onto the truck. Then the truck was tied in the back like you tie cargo, and we felt we were traveling the next thing we knew, we were standing near a river, and the truck was backing up, and suddenly two, I don't know what, I can't call them animals, because animals wouldn't do that, have never done that. But two parasites came laughing, joking, in fact, one of them had a flashlight that if, in order to get it to, you know, flash, he had, in fact, my daughter, I found out, bought for my grandson a toy, and I said, Bunny, where did you get that? I've been looking for it all my life. It's a flashlight that by pushing, it has its own battery. You don't need a battery. What is a dynamo? It has, it creates its own electricity. And it made that noise. I didn't forget it till today. And when my daughter showed it to me as a toy, I said, Bunny, you gotta give it to me. She said, no. Don't take it away from the baby. I said, this I have to take away from the baby. She says, no, I'll buy you one. I'll get you another one. I got to have it because you wouldn't believe it what a child remembers. And that thing was making zzzz. And I said, if ever I find this man with that thing, I'll know who he was. And so when we got to the edge of the river, like, uh, like a cliff, Looking down, we saw so many bodies, and they looked like tree trunks. They looked like something that came from when the snow melts, and it brings all kinds of tree trunks and everything with it, and the river was yellow. But then I noticed that as if a mother was trying to keep her child from drowning, and then one talking to her says, ah, it's too far, let's, let's take them elsewhere. And so they turned the truck down, retied the truck, and took us across the Nyester. And um, at that point, it was late. 
and they lined us up, and the only thing he said, I want you to know that I brought you to a very safe place. From here, you people are on your own. You don't have to worry. Nobody's going to harm you. We could have done some terrible things to you, but because we were so good to you, please, we would like you to give up if there is any valuable that you might have left. And my mother was struggling with her wedding ring. A cheap little gold ring, a thin little, but to her it was her life. And I said, Mother, why didn't you give it to me and I'll put it in my mouth. I doubt if they'll search my mouth. And she gave it to me and I put it in my mouth and they took everything away from everybody. And of course, I saved her that ring. A half an hour later, hell opened up. I mean, you've never seen fire, but when you don't know, it's just like, the best way to describe is if to, 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 to take an animal in front of you, tie it to the tree, and start shooting at it. You'll see what a reaction you get from an animal that doesn't understand. And here are human beings that do understand. People were screaming, falling on the ground, the machine guns, the individual, and then just as it started, that's how it quieted down, and moans and groans, and the next thing, we were a handful of people left. There was one elderly man, he said, I don't know if they're reloading, if they ran out of ammunition, or if it's a trick, or if it's a coffee break. But one thing I will tell you, stay on the ground, let's give them another 15 minutes. If nothing happens, we will have to see how badly we're hurt and who can go further, because I think I remember this place from the First World War. And so we started after 15, 20 minutes, slowly together. My brother was wounded, my father was wounded, my mother had a bad wound, but she managed somehow to walk. I still have pieces of metal in both my eyes, pieces from, from like a step now, from what I don't know. Either it came from another human being where it split off and it came through me. And we went and we walked and we walked inside the fields and ultimately we came to a little town called Tlust and we saw a little synagogue and uh, the big announcement came that it's Tisha B'Av and that we have to fast. And I said to myself, no, this is really, this is really, who has had anything to eat, number one, and that these people would remember Tisha B'Av. What what a wonderful gift from God that Tisha B'Av should be so important. Well, you know, Tisha B'Av is the destruction of the first two temples, you know. So, you know, it's like a, a day of mourning. We don't eat, we fast, and we pray all day. And they went in to pray and all that. And while they were praying, and I was out there with other few kids playing, I saw a man who was once tall and strong walk towards me, and I could see that there were tears coming down his face. And my father finally reached me and he said to me, I have a nickname, Put You. He said, Put You, you were born a twin, but you're a lucky twin. You're blonde and blue eyes, and you always had an attitude about you that I think you can survive. Please save yourself. I think you could get lost among the Christians. You're able to work, your work in the fields. You'll, you'll, somehow you'll manage and you'll be able to hide your faith, your, you know, your love for your God and all that. And I said to myself, if I am that able to do that thing, how can I leave my family? How can I leave these people? I can be of service to them by going into the marketplace, maybe pick up some things for them to eat, or maybe find out where the Gestapo is, or where the SS headquarters is, or hear some news and all that. Well, I did that. I refused to leave. 
I told my father, this blonde hair and blue eyes will help you, and David did it with Goliath, and I will do it, and I will do it with, 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 uh, with our murderers. And so that's what I did. I went out and I learned a few things, and I was able to pick up a few things. There were some people who were generous enough for a golden ring or a golden watch or a pair of shoes or, or, or a shirt to exchange for uh, produce because all that country was nothing but fields and, and orchards. Beautiful country, rich country. In fact, still one of the richest countries that, uh, that, uh, that we have in Europe. It's the Ukraine, Galicia, Ukraine, a beautiful country, beautiful soil, rich soil. And so, but I overheard in, this, in the marketplace that there is going to be practice. And you know, there was at one time when the SS would have a practice. They would pick a Monday where they would practice on people. They would pick out 200 men or 200 boys or 200 women, and they would practice their sharpshooting on them. They would line them up and see who can fire better. And eventually, that Monday came, and of course, my father and young brother, younger, older than I, but younger than I, because I, I lived to be older. He was 15 years old. He insisted on lining up with my father, and together, holding hands, they were murdered. And after that murder, of course, that I had to, in a sense, watch, and yet deny to my mother, deny it, although she knew it in her heart, that they were murdered, until Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, she admitted to me that she knew all along well, anyway, my mother had a dream after that murder. And my mother believed in morning dreams. And she wakes me up four in the morning. I don't know if she had to wake me up. She wakes me up four in the morning. She said to me, my child, I had a dream. I had a dream that I went up to pick blueberries. And I got so busy picking them that I got lost because as I picked them, each bush had nicer ones and bigger ones. And finally, when I got to the top of the mountain, I had lost my way. And there was a man there with a beard, an old man, and I said to him, can you please tell me I've lost my way? And he said, go back the same way you came. And I said to my mother, mother, we cannot go back the same way we came because we cannot cross the Nyester. I said, but we can find out if there is another way if we could sneak out of the ghetto, if we could go maybe another way. And God was very good to us, we thought. And then we wandered for nine months, not knowing where we're going. And in the nine months, I wasn't able to see myself, but I was able to see my mother. And from being a human being, she became a skeleton. Besides, her feet were cut up from all the, the, the the fresh harvest and all that, when they cut the grass and all that, the, the, the straw and all that. Well, make a long story short, we finally reached a point and we came down a hill and I'll never forget it. And it had to be nine, ten o'clock in the evening. And we saw a man in a gray flannel suit, and I mean it, in a gray flannel suit leaning against the bicycle. And normally I would go and feel out, smell out the town to see what I see in the Gestapo or SS, even if, even if I was just suspicious, I would say, let's wait till the town is clear, till there isn't too much traffic. But my mother must have been already, you know, I don't know how, not insane, but absent of her total mind. And she said, that nice man, I bet you he could help us. And she went over to him and she said, Maybe you could tell me where I could get some food, some change of clothing, some, maybe even some water to wash. And he said, are you lucky? Are you lucky that you met me? Because if someone else, you would be in deep trouble. And he took us straight to the Gestapo. And with the Gestapo, we spent roughly two weeks. And they were very nice. We did wash, there was a basin in the, 
outside from the rain and we washed and all that. Two weeks later, they loaded us on cattle car trains and within a few days, we arrived to this heavenly place called Auschwitz. And let me tell you, compared to Galicia, which maybe a handful of people made it, Auschwitz was heaven. Because one thing in Auschwitz, if you pass the arrival selection, at least you knew that whatever dirt you got in the morning for breakfast, that was given to you. For Sailor Pell, after Sailor Pell, you got your little coffee, tea, whatever you want to call it. I don't know. Maybe a combination of both. Whatever came, gemüse, soup, you know, the soup, lunchtime, you got it. My mother wouldn't eat it because she was afraid that there might be some lot, you know, some non-kosher. I said, Mother, God will forgive you, but she wouldn't listen to me. And, of course, being a twin, Mengele liked us. He liked me, particularly because I had faith, and he saw that in me right away. And within a short time, I became his guinea pig. My twin sister became his guinea pig. And we were not his first guinea pigs, nor were we his last guinea pigs. Whatever he did, whatever he wanted to do, whatever they wanted to do, the pain was not so much what they did to me, but what they did to my little twin sister and to my mother. Because she had to, she had to see her children being subjected to such, uh, I don't know what you call it, um, it's not torture, but inhumanity, because sometimes these needles didn't hurt so much as, as it touched the heart, because you're dealing with people with white robes, you're dealing with doctors, you're dealing with nurses, you're dealing with people who look like you, they sound like you, they talk like you, and when you find among so many of them, not one of them responding in a human way, it's, it's very difficult to accept. But being a Jew, that helped me. Now, when I say being a Jew, I can't say my twin sister is my kind of Jew, because I don't know if she is my kind of Jew. To me, being a Jew is having to accept everything for the sake of survival. There was nothing on earth that I could do except torment myself in order to analyze this thing. I couldn't analyze it. I could only accept it. And I could only deal with it by saying, it doesn't matter. It will pass tomorrow. If someone would have said to me, are you going to die from this? My answer would have been never. If someone would have said, are you going to be free someday? Yes. And when you're free, what are you going to tell the world? What are you going to do? Are you going to do the same thing to other people? My answer would be, I am going to tell people to be good, to be kind, to be considerate, because what I suffered, no human being should ever suffer. And so when new people came to Auschwitz, it wasn't easy because often they could not rationalize the place. They thought that they could sit and discuss how to escape or how to get away. The truth of the matter, it wasn't, it wasn't that simple and uh, very few people tried and very few people got away. It wasn't, as some people think, that besides the electric fence, after liberation people found out how many posts you had to go through and then you first had to cross over a river. And unfortunately, with a number on your arm, far you couldn't go. Without a set of clothing that would make you look like a civilized human being, you couldn't go very far. But faith, and what I told my twin sister, faith, pretend it doesn't hurt. The more it hurts, the more you have to pretend that it doesn't hurt. 
We owe it to our mother, we owe it to God to survive. And so one day, the ultimate day came. It was May 15th, maybe 30th, and Mengele ordered this particular camp, Bates White Bay, which was a Czech family camp from Theresienstadt, to be ex liquidated, exterminated, annihilated. And then finally, they lined up all the guinea pigs. And I'll never forget, the gate was this way. And the boys were in this line, and the girls were in this line. And my mother was standing in barrack number two, which is still there. And when I looked at my mother standing in line, and once you stood in line, and you had Mengele with his entourage of all the big shots, you did not leave the line. When I saw my mother stand there and looking like a ghost, I broke away from the line and my little twin sister grabbed my arms and I went over and I said to my mother, we're not afraid. If you want to, we'll stay with you and we'll do whatever we have to do together. And this is what my mother told me then. She said, mein Kind, glaub in God. My child, believe in God. Love God. Live and help these children because you seem to have a certain strength and courage to endure. Help your little twin sister, help the others. If you survive with hate and bitterness and only to seek revenge, I will ask God to send you to me. But if you survive loving humanity, and if you tell humanity what we went through for the sake of sharing with humanity so that we and our future may never have even to dream, even in a movie to go through, even reading a book about it to go through what we went through because it's beyond words, it's beyond description and what makes it even more difficult is that we were constantly dealing with educated, brilliant, cultured, civilized human beings. I know it. I was liberated. And I saw them when they were in my place. And let me tell you something. They were not proud of what they did. They wouldn't stand up and say, I did what I did, I believed in it, and nothing you could do to me would make me care because I am proud of what they were all ashamed. Are we humans capable of doing terrible things to one another? Yes. Should we think five times before we ever do anything like that? We should not even think of doing anything like that. It should be a crime to think of harming another human being because he is whatever he is. Of, we're all God's children. We're all one race, human race. And we should all care and love and share with one another. And that would make life worthwhile living. It's not how much you have. It's how much you can share. And I promised my mother that if I survive, I will share. And I will not hate. And there is something that I said here, and I would like someone who would want to read this, because I didn't know that the wall was coming down the week that I'm going to be here. And people want to know, how do I feel about the wall coming down? The wall should have never been there in the first place. But one thing I can tell you, that I'm very proud. They have finally learned how to do things without murdering one another. They were able to do things without even, by error, a shot being fired. Isn't that wonderful that finally the German people may not think that the only way to heaven is with a big gun or by killing other people? I only hope that it's not only for today that it's for tomorrow, and they search their hearts and souls, 
and I hope that East Germany will finally admit, like the president of West Germany admitted, saying yes. Mr. Berkowitz says we're responsible. I'm going to add to it. We are guilty. And Mr. Berkowitz said in Jerusalem, what they don't know, we know. Because what we know, they don't know. Why and how we did it. What was the purpose behind that? What did we want to achieve? I would like to know. I still don't know. What did they want to conquer the world? They know. No nation on earth can conquer the world. Every human being, every nation has a right to be a nation. Every faith has a right to their faith. And together we can conquer one thing. The little life that we have on this planet earth and to blossom within that short little life and to make that life worth living. And with that I want to say God bless you all. I want this someone to read if you care to read it. Because it will show you what I said in 1945. Would you mind reading it? Do you have the Richard? Richard? Do you have the articles? Yeah, I want you to read this because if I had said that tonight, you would have said Mr. Berkowitz is a wise man. I want you to here first. When I recognized myself, I didn't say it's me. What I said, my God. Right? Mm. Yeah. Here, read this. Mm. Can you see? It's a photograph of some faces of some of the uh, victims at the uh, camp looking outwards. There's a young boy with an arrow above his head, and the title says, My God, It's Me. Mark Berkowitz left, 29 was in the Rivoli Theater watching Mein Kampf, documentary of Nazi savagery, when he saw this death camp film clip. His horrified gaze froze on the face of a boy with the arrow. It's me, my God, it's me, he cried out. He had come face to face with a terrifying past. Where is he going? And this is another article further well, from on. the same, except this Ma front page, just the second page. Right. Mark Berkowitz went to a movie and saw a nightmare. By the way, I didn't want to go, but my friends, American friends, insisted. And I said, what am I going to see? I live it every moment of my life. I can't get it out of me. I would love to get part of it out of me, but I can't. I live it for the millions of children that perished. The picture was Mein Kampf, newsreel clips and other films that recreate the days of terror when Adolf Hitler cast his dark, demented shadow over the world. Berkowitz, 29, sat in the darkened Rivioli Theater and watched the grim scenes of Nazi sadism unfold on the screen. To others in the audience, it was a gripping documentary of man's inhumanity to man. To Berkowitz, it was as real as a scream in the night. His eyes fastened on the face of a half-starved boy at the Auschwitz death camp in Poland. The boy was looking at him, pleadingly, as if searching for someone with a soul. Suddenly, Berko Berkowitz leaped to his feet and cried out, It's me! My God, it's me! The 12-year-old boy at Auschwitz was indeed Mark Ber Berkowitz. The time was 1945. Russian troops had just stormed the camp. The Nazis were fleeing in terror. A Soviet cameraman filming the scenes of horror at the camp trained his camera on the little boy. As Mark, now a prosperous salesman with a pretty wife and two children, regained his composure, he lived again the terror that filled his early years. A native of Czechoslovakia, Mark, his parents, three sisters, and a brother were herded into a concentration camp near their home in 1941. He saw hundreds of other Jews at the camp thrown into a river to drown, but somehow the Berkowitz family escaped into Poland. 
They were soon recaptured by the Germans and then began the terrible life of one killer camp after another until Mark ended up at Auschwitz. There was Birkenau in Poland where Adolf Eichmann ruled like a wild beast and Do Dr. Joseph Mengele practiced his filthy human experiments. Mark and his twin sister were two of Mengele's guinea pigs. There was a day when a long line of Jews was marching into a gas chamber and Mark saw his own mother walking along silently to her death. There was the day his father and young brother were shot to death by SS men. And then the Russians stormed the camp and freed the prisoners. They gave Mark a rifle and told him to help them kill his captors. But the boy who had lived with death almost all his life threw down the gun and refused. As he left the movie and walked down Broadway, a place of sunshine and gaiety, Mark repeated what he said to the Russians that day at Auschwitz, the killing must stop, there has been too much killing. And the best part of it all, thank you. <laughs> And the proof, of the, the proof of it all is the Russians didn't shoot me for it, except they gave me a duty that I want you to know is very funny. There was a mountain of ammunition that I don't know why, whether it was used up or whether it wasn't used up. It was hand grenades. It was all kinds of military garbage. And I had to go on that mountain and pick out what was good and what was bad. And when a Russian officer saw me on top of that mountain for being penalized for not taking up a, a gun, you should have seen what he did to the guy that gave me that job. He almost sent him to Siberia. I had to plead with him. I says, he didn't know what was on that mountain. When getting down from that mountain wasn't easy either because I had to trace my footsteps because they were afraid that I may touch a pin or something that would blow me to, to pieces. But the truth of the matter is, faith is a very strong and a very beautiful thing. And with faith in God and love for humanity, that is not because I have to but because I want to. That's the big difference. I am here today, and I hope that I can share this someday with future generations only to say one thing, that the most beautiful thing in life is still to love, to share, and to care, and to realize that life does have an end. We don't have to end it. It comes to an end and no one knows when that end comes. I love you, God bless you, and may you never forget to remember, and always remember not to forget, that we're all God's children. Thank you. people that might have some questions to my insanity. Yes. Well, when a mother gives birth to her children, whether it's one or many, she hopes for the best children on this earth. And she has to part with that umbilical cord. I look at God as giving us the ability to be kind and to be of giving. But we wouldn't want any strings attached to him so that he or she or nature might dictate to us, as if we were zombies, how we should live. When a person has a true faith and a true love, there is no man that can come to me and entice me to hate anybody. That man has not been born yet, will never be born. And that is what makes a person of strength 
and true humanity. Humanity is not something one can buy and sell. Humanity is not something that can be swayed by democracy, uh, being Republican, communism, fascism, Nazism, or any other ideology that even, even I might agree with. No, Zionism cannot make me a hater. Thank God Zionism has not made us hate yet. When you go to Israel and you see the kibbutzim, they're willing to share their last piece of bread and work without knowing whether or not they have a future for working, then you'll realize what a beautiful thing kindness is. I've seen it. I, I saw something. Can I share it with you? I went to a kibbutz in Ramad David. And when I went to see the cattle, I was surprised that the numbers on the cattle were dusted on. And I started to cry. And one of the men from the kibbutz came over to me and he says, I know why you're crying. I said, because cattle are normally branded. He said, we don't brand anything anymore. You see? I was happy to see that they wouldn't even brand a cattle. Look what humanity, supposedly, the civilized world, the culture, does have in folk. Look what the great invention they have. They gave me a number. The genius. The genius had conquered the world with their genius and they had to murder their people to lose what they had conquered. Today, every American wants a Mercedes, right? Today, the world is frightened because with Germany and the Soviet Union, they have a market of a billion people. I don't know. This is not politics. And with their ingenuity and all that, they have discovered how to conquer the world without firing a shot. Tell me what human being will not drive a Volkswagen than he can afford to drive? Or buy something that is quality-wise less expensive now, do you care if it's German or Japanese? Isn't it crazy that they had to go and try to conquer the world when they had already conquered the world? Now they discovered through me that they already had conquered the world. They would have had the whole world. Science they had, right? Technology they had, right? Religion they had. Music they had, poetry they had, philosophy they had. What did they need to invade the world for? And I told them that. I said, why did you have to listen to a mad, to a mad, and I don't want to say dog, because I've never seen a dog murder human beings or murder even animals like that. So it's not a dog, it's a parasite. So you reduced yourself to parasites, and how are you going to tell your children? How are you going to tell them to explain to the world that they are innocent? How? How are they going to walk into a school in Jerusalem and study physics or science or medicine and claim to be healers? How? Who gave you the right to condemn your own people for eternity. Who would I permit my people to do that to me? Not in a billion years. So that is what we have to understand. And we owe it to ourselves to be human beings. Let us be human beings. Find out if it's possible. I believe it is possible. And when you're a human being, then you're everything. You're a communist, a socialist, a democrat, a republican, because you're a human being. You're tolerant to everything. And nobody's wrong, because you're a brother, and you're a sister, and you're a fellow human being who cares enough to say, maybe he's got a toothache and he's bitter today, but let's see if I can take some of that bitterness out of him and share it with him, instead of picking on an innocent people and, 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 and slaughtering them like, uh, and, and slaughtering themselves. Any other question? Yes, God was good to me, uh, good to me, to all of us. 
I, after the war was over, I had one brother and two sisters, including my twin sister. But there is one problem that my twin sister lives missing her mother, and so it's very difficult. I miss my mother, but I permit my mother to be where she is because we all have to go someday. Unfortunately, that is not the way to go. They hold themselves responsible. Of course I hold them responsible. I hold the whole world responsible, but primarily them because they were willing to, to carry out the order. Have you been to Germany Yes. Well, when you say, have I been to Germany, being in Germany? No, I've been to Europe, but not to Germany. I don't see the world the way some people see it. I see, you know, <laughs> I've been to to part of this planet Earth. Yes. You say that, um, you say that the Germans learned to hate. Um, how do you think they learned to hate? And how did people learn to hate? Well, that that's... <coughs> how? When you allow yourself the luxury in believing that somehow you're a better person to the extent that you have privileges. See, I may be a better person, but I don't ex go to the extent of having privileges. That's the difference. I have no less, no more right, but I individually might feel that I'm a wonderful human being and better than you, but I wouldn't cross that borderline. I wouldn't cross your territory because you have rights too, if you understand what I just said. There's nothing wrong with feeling that you're a good human being without taking the right from another human being, feeling that he has just as much good qualities as you have. Well, when you use the word Palestinian, you mean Israelis or Palestinians? Because we can all call each other, I'm a Czech. Am I a Czech, a Jew, an American? What am I? When I came to America, I didn't start a revolution for Czechoslovakia. When I live in Israel, I'm an Israelite. In America, I'm an American. A Jew is my re religion, my faith. All right? Well, I never called it Palestine, and I'll tell you why. And this is the truth. When the Jew went into the guest chamber, and he said, Shema Yisrael. Now, you know what Shema Yisrael means? Can you translate what it says? No. Isn't it ironic that Israel comes before God even? So it says, Shema, hear you Israel. Am I correct or not? before even God, because we are the children of God. Not that we're the only ones that God chose, that's a lie. God, in fact, did not choose us. The truth is that God chose many others. We finally heard about his choosing and we said we volunteered <laughs> without even asking what the commitments are. Now, you want to know the answer? I'll give you an answer because I recently spoke to a beautiful group of people and then they invited me to their private class. And I'm going to tell you the truth now. When the survivor arrived in Haifa, it should have been his brother waiting for him, not the British. It should have been Ismail, right? His brother. Stepbrother. Brother. Right? No, they did not wait for the Muslim man. Finally, they have a complaint. And what was the complaint? That we... And I include myself, you see, I live in America, but I include myself, that we, the Jews, are treating the Arabs in Israel, that's what they said, equally the way we were treated by the Nazis. And I spoke to a group of Arab leaders, and I asked them two questions, and I said, you answer them for me, because if I'm a liar, I want to be exposed right in front of all these people. I said, tell me something. 
Why are the Jews in the world concerned with the birth rate of the Arab population in Israel? Would you please give me the birth rate of the Jews in Auschwitz? And they couldn't answer me. What was the birth rate of the Jews in Auschwitz? Can you tell me, please? Anybody here know? They exterminated the ones that weren't even born yet. And yet we're concerned with the birth rate of the Arabs in Israel. For the people that treat people like the Nazis, I wish Hitler had treated us that way. I would be saying to Hitler, I don't agree with you, but thank you very much. So that is the truth. Yes. 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 I want them, I want them to recognize one thing, that we're all God's children and refuse to drop, you know, uh, bombs in the marketplace, become citizens as I'm a citizen in America and I don't agree with everybody in America and I don't agree with every president that I've been under, but yet I never threatened a president, yes, if I have something to say, I'll say it, and they could say it. I am not going to say to you that we're perfect, because unfortunately there are some people that are not as kind as others, but don't ever compare it. And I can tell you one thing, if you could tomorrow bring us together, you would be considered not only a saint, but you would be considered a messiah. And most of the Jews in Israel and in the world would be grateful to you eternally. And I mean it, I'm not, I will walk into the Knesset with you and they'll embrace you. Are you working towards that? That, you are that is the only thing I know. You work with the with the I work with everybody. Equal, equal, equal. To me, there is no such thing as an Arab being less a human being than I, or living in Israel, an Arab should have less than I have. And the truth is, if you want to go and see for yourself, you'll see that I'm not lying. I don't have to lie to you. But neither should we be betrayed. It hurts to be betrayed. Well, it depends on, you know, the, I'm sure there are some English people who feel that America still belongs to them. You know, the saying goes that if George Washington got up tomorrow and walked in London, he would be tried for treason. He would be captured and tried for treason. And I think that Washington was a great man. So you see, it's, that's where we have to cross the bridge. That's what I said. I could be partially wrong, and you could be partially wrong. Only then can we admit that being partially wrong could make us partially right. Let's put the right together and the wrong together and live as human beings. Should Israel be a nation? Yes. The proof of the pudding is that when East Germany crossed over to West Germany, it wasn't with gunpowder because they have a representation and the Jews are entitled to have a representation. It's time already that we had representation. And we didn't take anything away from anybody. All of us knew how to go home. We didn't find us ourselves strangers, and I'm not making it up. When was the last time you saw Mangeli before you were rescued? Christmas Eve. And then when were you, when were you rescued? I was not rescued. I was liberated the 27th of January, 1945. May I something? This is my friend. Survivor of Washington concentration camp. Thank God. Thank God. Not far from Salatfana. What do you mean, Barak Sars? I was in Barak Sars. When I came home after the war, you know what I saw in Barak Sars? I saw more knocked out tanks lined up in Barak Sars. You could look at the tanks for miles, and you saw those beautiful German tanks, and with their guns up there, and uh, they weren't moving. Yeah. No. 
Well, you went when my twin sister went to Bergen Belsen. Yeah, yeah, with Anne Frank, with, uh, you know. Yeah. yeah, thank God. You're a miracle. And that's what's beautiful, that we believe in miracles. And it's a miracle. And you want to know the truth? That we have to also live with people who sometimes don't tell exactly and claim. And yet, what are we going to do about it? You know what I'm talking about. Because having been there, having lived there, having smelled having bred that air, it's in us. And I want to tell you something because I'm going to say something, but try to understand what I'm going to say. The darker the earth, the richer the earth. You know that? That's the truth. And I don't know if Moses was exactly like me. But that doesn't mean that everybody has to feel that way. And we don't have to necessarily fight with that person who might be arrogant or ignorant enough to believe in his image. There are some people who want to live and die in their ignorance. There's nothing wrong with that. Providing you're willing to allow him to live. Let him live. Because in life we can find out. Mengele lived to find out that his little boy is a better friend to him and to his people than he could have ever been a friend to his people. He should have been a person to say, money I don't need, fame I don't need, who am I to walk in a uniform and serve what? Death? That's a service? Do you understand what I just said? Any human being that services death is not a human being. Any human being that services life that's why I glorify our young men and women who gave their lives for the country and to liberate me. Whether he's Russian, whether he's a communist, whether he's a Democrat, whether he's a Republican, when he gave his life, his ultimate measure, for a little boy that he never even dreamt existed, that to me, and let me tell you, a beautiful letter I wrote not too long ago, and I got an answer for it. And I have people write for me because I cannot read and write, but I can, I can share my feelings. And I wrote to a Russian general, Vasily Fedorenko. He liberated Auschwitz. And you know, he came to visit. He was promised that he would meet me because he's the one that took pictures. He's an old man. He's 75, 76 years old. And I wrote to him, disregarding that at that moment, Reagan called him the evil empire. And it might be. There are evil people there, I'm sure. But there are some good people too. So you don't bury the good ones for the few bad ones. So I wrote to him, as a 12-year-old boy, seeing you giving back my freedom, my dignity, a liberator to be is the noblest in man. And therefore, you shall always live in my heart as the noblest. Maybe he's the one that told Gorbachev, let the people go. Look at this little boy. Look how he believes in this faith. Look how he believes that when they gave him to shoot, he said, what am I going to prove by shooting? What am I going to do to, to shoot death? I should waste a bullet to shoot death? Do you get what I'm saying? These people have death. And do you know what it is? When I, saw, when I saw the young people climbing over the wall, I could sense which ones are free. And then I saw a couple of older people. And they were so afraid to go near that wall because they were built in with such rigidity. Is that the right word? So rigid that they know only one thing, that everything is aggression. And I said to myself, I wonder if he wasn't in one of the SS divisions, because you could see the man fear. When everybody's going, crossing over to West Germany, because he knows that he doesn't believe in freedom, he could not allow himself the luxury of that freedom of going over to the other side to say hello to his brother, because guilt. I wish I could tell the German children not to live in that guilt. 
but it's very difficult to tell a gentle person or a gentle child how, how to rationalize such guilt. How do you rationalize such guilt? Should they be guilty? No. Are they responsible? We're all responsible. I am responsible. I'm responsible for what I said, hoping that it's not misunderstood. I'm not a fool. I believe in defending myself. I did defend myself by surviving, but not by killing. Not son, my brother. Well, when I was in Jerusalem, I made a speech, and the prime minister was there, and other people were there, including the ambassador from West Germany and other ambassadors. And in Poland, I met with the ambassador from East Germany and all that. And I'm going to tell you what I said. And I want you to know that this country is built out of ashes. You know that. Do you know that Washington was burned to the ground? And look what a beautiful city it is, right? Out of Auschwitz, we must build a world. Out of Auschwitz, this is not pretense. We will have learned that there is no shortcut, neither success, by seeking the destruction of any people. If a nation wants to be mighty and wants to be recognized as a power, it's only through wisdom, through generosity, and through this. Not through this. This is short-lived, but this lasts forever. When I think of King Solomon, I know that not many countries could live without King Solomon. Not many courts could live without King Solomon. Not many nations could exist without Ten Commandments. Not that we shouldn't have more, and we have more. But it's wonderful to know that someone came with two aspirin pills and didn't say, you must obey. In fact, the people were already making a golden calf. He went and repaired them and brought them back. And he said, thou shall not kill. And of course, sometimes we have to defend ourselves. But other than that, we should always honor one another. Is it simple? Is it easy? No. For me, it's very simple, very easy. It's part of me. It's in my grain. This is the tree that I am. This is the grain of my tree. Yes. What were your feelings during the search that took place for Dr. Mangalet? That the world was doing exactly what the world has been doing all along, is making fun of oneself. Because um, if the world would have taken a little time out to gather these people, to gather, you heard the word I said, to gather, and then with enough information to categorically see what they did and what they didn't do, including if they did something that we may not know. Maybe they did something that might be helpful to humanity, like Dr. Mengele's research and all that might be helpful. Using it, I'm not against it. If it's going to save one life, it's one life out of the ashes. So a child in Auschwitz perished, but a child in America may be saved from a rare disease or maybe never having that disease. That's what we should have done. We should have lived up to our commitments to our young men and women who gave their lives to bring them to justice. Now remember, bringing them to justice doesn't mean lining them up against the wall and doing exactly what they did. Let justice, for the sake of justice, be carried out. But we didn't do it. Are we going to cry over it? No. Will we sometimes dwell over it? Yes, we dwell a lot of times. But um, time is running out. Now we have to think for the future of the future generation. Most of these men are very old. There's still a couple of them around. And some of them are willing to come to America and meet on television and talk to me. They don't want to have other people because they feel being embarrassed and all that. But there's a Dr. Munch who was with Dr. Mengele. He's um, 
willing to come. He's willing to admit everything. He's not proud. He feels that he should have been tried and judged. He feels by not being tried and judged, he went through worse hell because instead of serving 10 years and then being free, he was constantly till today hiding. You cannot get away with such things because you have to live within yourself. And you have never tried to live in someone else's body when that body feels that it is less than human. God forbid you should ever have to feel that way. Mengele box. He box. When his son said to him, I believe what Mr. Berkowitz said is correct. Regardless of whether you did anything or not is immaterial. You had no right to be there. What were you doing there? What was the purpose of being there? Why did you have to go to Auschwitz? You know, nobody had to go to Auschwitz. You know that. There is no court martial of an assessment ever being tried and executed for refusing to serve in any of the death camps or any of the camps at all. And there are some who refuse. And there are some who acted like decent human beings, although they are responsible. But yet, when we stand trial, we as victims sometimes will say, oh, he, I, you know, he tried to be human, but, uh, you know, collectively he's responsible. Yeah. So remember, we have to live with ourselves. There's something I'm going to tell you right now. Can I tell you what it is? No one can die for us. Neither can anyone live for us. And anything that we do that isn't right, not only God judges us, the worst part of it all, when we judge ourselves, even God cannot help us. And that is what we have to learn, to be responsible human beings. And again, to learn three essential things to be human. And that doesn't mean you have to give away your wealth and all that, but just knowing what it is to care, to share, and to love. Once you have that, you're a free human being. And to me, that is the most beautiful thing that life has to offer. And if you don't have that, I don't give you lift to be 120. You're wasting your time. Thank you, and God bless you. I love you and have a happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy it. Uh, there's a reception following in blue in Atwood Blue Room for all those interested. Uh, refreshments and you'll be able to meet Mr. Berkowitz.